official host for the event remains to be the TAI. You are aware that we host once in two years an event called Tunneling Asia. We could not hold it this year because of the pandemic situation. Hopefully, if all goes well, in the beginning of the next year, we are planning to host one. Along with the Tunneling Asia, we also host the Tunneling Awards. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I must also re-emphasize that one of the major activities that we very seriously undertake is the safety. Safety aspects of the tunneling activities. Now, as part of our overall umbrella, we also have a comparatively new organization called the Young Members. We very recently had a program being done by them on the tunneling day. That is on the 4th of December. And last month, or rather last to last month, we had uh, nominated a new executive members of the young tunnelers, or the young members of the Tunneling Association of India. Now, so much about the introduction. Uh, speaker of the day is no stranger to us. He's very well known, Dr. Harrell Wagner. He's an international personality in the field of tunneling. And uh, like I said, he is in addition to his doctorate okay, in this field, the research oriented doctorate in this field. He's a licensed master builder, a government counselor, chartered expert at court, a consultant, has been a consultant at, with the World Bank for more than 15 years, and is an international consultant for underground structures. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll be happy to know that he's put in more than 40 years in the tunnel design, construction, consultancy. He's also been an assistant professor in the Graz University. He's been vice president with the International Tunneling Association and also has served as an expert member with the Executive Council of ITA. His, I always say that his biodata I can read for about half an hour. I won't go into more of it. You can read about him more on the international pages. But what actually pleases all of us is that he's very enthusiastic about this subject. And you just have to approach him to teach us, to share with us, to explain to us any aspect on tunneling. I think he's more than willing always to do it. So that much about our speaker. Coming to the subject for the day, we've chosen a very, very appropriate subject transport tunnel specifics in design and construction. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we understand that in the modern day, the transport tunnels for rail, road, underground mass transportation system, that is your primarily your metros, they need innovative techniques to improve the project delivery, quality management, and mitigation of risks and hazards. Everybody is asking that come out with more and more innovative methods, innovative ideas, innovative documentation, so that we can reduce these risks. Now, if we, we know that when we look at the project, the whole life cycle of a project starts with the ground investigations. If the investigations are good, you can establish a good baseline geotechnical report. Risk management is an ongoing process irrespective of whatever you may have thought of, in an underground space, this do happen. Or the accidents, I will not say accidents, but then incidents do happen. You have to take care of that. Not tunneling, whether it is conventional or it is mechanized, it's a very complex process. So worldwide, the theme is reduce the cost and time. Nobody wants to indulge more in time and cost overrun. And that is where we need to have these innovative methods. That's why the project management and the contract management become very, very important. And we are very happy now that the FIDIC has already taken out a book which is specialized in the tunneling contracts. Tunneling contracts have become simpler now. And basically, uh, they are they can very well imagine now and anticipate some risks and the risk allocation is very well defined in the contract now more and more of it is but in addition to that uh, like i initially mentioned that it is not only pre-construction activities the 
During construction activities, also you have to be very watchful. You have to continuously monitor. You have to keep checking it out. The things should not go wrong. The observational approach is already an adopted approach that during the construction, a little bit of tweaking of the design, a little bit of tweaking of the construction sequence does happen. It should remain accountable and it should remain uh, part of the contract. And that's why our contracts have to be a little more flexible. The point that I'm getting is that you can't have very rigid straight line contracts in case of tunneling. There are many nuances involved. So there should be inherent flexibility available to the both the management and the, or the employer and the contractor to not for any wrongful reasons, but for the right reasons so that the work does not suffer. And unfortunately, if something happens, which is not foreseen, we should be able to apportion the, the uh, accountability of that. And the last point is that we know that when the tunneling, we speak of tunneling, tunneling is only primarily two kinds. One is either we go to the mountains and cut through the mountains for the road, for the rail, for the hydro, or else in the plain areas, when we go underground, basically we are creating an underground space. Whether it is for metro or for any other activity, the sewage tunnel, the, the stormwater drains, the storage, underground storage, it could be anything but exploitation of the underground space. So with that, I will not take any more of your time. And over to speaker now, Dr. Wagner. Yes. Thank over you. to you, sir. Over to you for your, for your talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency General Suresh Sharma. <clears throat> I appreciate a lot. You rightly said that I am really enthusiastic about uh, not only tunneling, but in particular about uh, giving uh, these online uh, lectures uh, to the Tunneling Association of India. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, a presentation that I edit uh, slides to the presentation. I'm not sure whether you show the sequence of the presentation which I submitted to you about a week ago, or if you are showing the presentation which I have edited. Basically refer to the full page. It comes. Uh, uh, Dr. Wagner, if I can take a minute. Your, yes. your voice your voice is cracking. I think you'll have to be closer to the mic. Your, your voice is cracking, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good, Maybe good now, good. Is better now? Yeah, better. <clears throat> okay. Maybe, maybe I am not uh, Placido Domingo, you know, it's not so, so beautiful. <laughs> anyway. Uh, largest agglomerations of the of the largest urban development yeah, uh, basically the development of the mega cities as it is shown on the first slide i mean can can we look at the first slide maybe it is in that i, I think i i have to ask you to to show the next slide Yes, the next, next slide is the content. And let's uh, briefly talk about the content because it uh, shows what you are going to hear in the next uh, couple of hours. After the introduction, I'm talking a little bit about the European Railway Renaissance, about uh, project management tools, which uh, His Excellency General Sharma also mentioned, about the importance of documentation and the construction process as such including uh, controlling and plausibility and quality controlling design uh, process, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, standardized already, and understanding uh, transportation with regard to road tunnels, uh, geologic assessment, construction stages. And finally, uh, we will uh, give you a summary and conclusions. Can you show the next slide? <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the, uh, the, the three slides. 
quickly on, on that. But that's fine. So largest uh, urban agglomerations in the world, ten biggest cities, uh, which are cities uh, between uh, 40 million and, and 20 million uh, uh, in, in Asia, but also less uh, in, in Europe. We don't have uh, development. Hello. May I request to the participant kindly mute their mic, please? Hello. Okay. Any, any, I will show in the next slide. Uh, See, voice is not clear. <coughs> what can I do? <laughs> now, now it's better. Now it's no? better. No, and, uh, uh, yeah, Doctor Wagner, when you when you look straight, your voice yes. is clear. But when you look sideways, maybe you're looking at your screen. When you look sideways, your voice goes away. Voice fades away. So you'll have to see that you know, <laughs> as you're talking to us, you'll have to probably look straight. For your voice to reach us, you know, oh. whenever you whenever you turn your face towards the other side, the voice fades away. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> in in the same context, uh, in the preface, I wanted to mention something uh, which is very actual. You know, we are uh, getting information of the man of the year which is Mr. Elon Musk. And Mr. Elon Musk has been a pioneer uh, in regard to electric vehicles, in regard to uh, space uh, craft development, in regard also to tunnel boring machines, where he thinks that uh, he can show the tunneling industry uh, how to better and cheaper and faster make tunnels, which is a very, very challenging uh, view of it, because uh, he can really rest on the merits which he has uh, achieved for electric vehicles and, and for the uh, exploration of, of space and, and uh, rocket technology. In my opinion, he could not do that without infrastructure. And the most important part of infrastructure in our development land, which I did uh, so, uh, in in uh, these slides, which I just mentioned, uh, is that uh, the development of underground space in urban areas, in particular in the ten largest cities of of this of this planet. So, uh, at least I think that uh, one of our uh, members of the International Tunneling Association should become a pioneer and, and should, uh, should become a pioneering award for the work which is done for the underground infrastructure in our world. And uh, I would suggest that to the Journal of Times or to any, any other, uh, we, unfortunately we cannot get an award from the, uh, from the Nobel Committee, from the Nobel Prize Committee, because that's excluded. <laughs> Uh, architecture and, con and civil engineers are not included in, in the Nobel laureate. But uh, I think uh, that uh, the discipline as such for underground structure should get uh, an award for the uh, merit which has been uh, given to this world uh, through underground infrastructure. So that is just an idea which I would like uh, to, to, to place uh, to you in the context of the Tunneling Association of India. And India is, is the fastest growing and progressing nation in the world, in my opinion. And why is this? Of course, everybody talks about the uh, world economy number one and world economy, uh, economy number two, which is going to over number one. 
But India is in a better position, and India will overtake uh, China in, in the next uh, 10 to uh, 25 years in regard to size. India will always be stronger. And why can I say that India is stronger? Because the agricultural land of India has more than 30 to 40 percent agricultural land is uh, the uh, is, is is what what uh, India has in comparison with China. So India is going to to grow and and India is going to be the one uh, in in the world. Okay. So uh, let let's talk about. After the uh, transportation transportation. So uh, we have to uh, uh, agree that uh, the environment drives the demand for transportation uh, as, as it is uh, uh, driven also by demographic changes and economic growth and must be coupled with an appreciation of the goals that transportation strives to achieve, such as providing mobility and access through efficient system performance, safety, equity, sustainability, and resilience, and the conditions that drive the transportation supply, such as financial and energy resources, governance, institutional capacity, and innovation. So these are these are very very outstanding goals in uh, uh, in, in in transportation and uh, transportation is so much important. Do you do you hear me now better? Is it is it better and and more clear so that everybody can understand what I'm telling? I I hope so because I I, I try to be closer to the to the microphone right now. Okay. The impression important for the public ownership and for the management of transportation infrastructure, which has a different set of incentives than those that drive the private sector innovation. These public sector incentives inhibit the risk taking and reward caution. In addition, infrastructure is a steady incremental gain in uh, design, construction, operation, management, and uh, is identified through applied research funded by the public. I cannot see because I have another block of uh, my of my uh, screen right now. Uh, maybe the operator can can delete that. Okay. Uh, anyway, we can go to the next slide. The views uh, of the International Tunneling Association in regards to mobility. By the way, uh, uh, General Sharma said that uh, I am uh, an expert to the uh, International Tunneling Association Board of Experts. But I'm also an auditor or a surveyor of the uh, annual financial uh, reports, which is uh, an instrument of, uh, of uh, governing and, and uh, driving the development of the International uh, Tunneling Association Committee on Education and Training. However, the expansion of underground mobility through interstate highway networks and rail extension with special emphasis on advantages provided by interactive communications with the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association is highlighted in the presentation of today. Uh, we have to, uh, to uh, understand and to accept and to recognize the expansion of underground mobility. If we look into the development of uh, high-speed trains, just as an example, then we have to uh, uh, recognize and acknowledge that uh, in China, yeah, during the last uh, two, two and a half decades, 30,000 kilometers of high-speed train have been built, including uh, almost 10,000 kilometers of, of uh, 
tunnels and all of these uh, to connect uh, the, the cities in the central part of China and the eastern uh, and the southern part of, of China, which uh, is for sure one explanation why China could develop so fast. And uh, I appreciate a lot every time I read something in regard to India and to the expansion of underground structures in Indian uh, urban developments and in India uh, interstate developments. I'm just uh, uh, just amazed and, and I'm, I'm just enthusiastic about that. What is the benefit? Well, the benefit, regardless the technology which is applied on any tunnel contract of today, is uh, coming from careful performing of ground investigations, resulting basically what is a technical term, a geotechnical baseline report together with the risk management plans, which go hand in hand and which is recognized and supported by all project stakeholders, be it uh, the owner of the project, the contractor, the designer, the consultant, that, that is uh, accepted uh, by all of them. So the next slide. The status of railways. Well, we have to uh, acknowledge that uh, railways uh, have been started uh, uh, to, to be developed in the last 150 to 100 years. And they are aging, so century-old network needs to be upgraded. The travel time is also an uh, important uh, key factor, uh, which is uh, right now in the old uh, 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 railway uh, systems, unattractive for passengers due to line features and uh, limited speed, limited uh, uh, limited space. So what is the, the result and, and the, the answer to the question is segregation. Restrictions in freight traffic due to limited are there as both passenger and freight traffic travel on the same line. And uh, we have some shortcomings in adaption to freight traffic and uh, we need to continuously update uh, in order to drop uh, the share of railway traffic uh, in, in, in regard to what is what is the cheapest traffic and, and uh, the, the cheap, cheapest traffic actually is maritime traffic. So we can go to the next slide. We'll uh, uh, show the uh, European Union strategy for new uh, railway uh, lines across the continent. So this strategy is focusing on the optimization of existing network by combining and upgrading existing with new sections. It is also uh, as part of the strategy to keep the concept of mixed traffic vis-a-vis uh, -vis high speed net for passengers so it's a, it's a mixed traffic uh, which is uh, uh, dictated by the topography of, of Europe. And then uh, we have uh, to increase the maximum speed where it is feasible and reasonable to approximately 200 kilometers per hour. So 200 kilometers per hour is a little bit different of what we have in, for instance, in, in, in Japan or in, in China also. And we have to increase the capacity on major routes where it is required by quadrupling existing lines. Uh, in the middle of that uh, uh, map on the right side, you can see a yellow area, and this is the yellow area of Austria, which is a landlocked country with uh, 85,000 square kilometers of, of area and uh, which uh, is uh, mountain covered, more than 60% of the country is mountain covered. So that means that uh, just by the topography of the country, there is a need for uh, uh, many towns. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, basically is talking about uh, the renaissance uh, in railway technology. 
uh, we have strengthening uh, to strengthen the capacity in using innovative technologies both in project delivery and in quality management. We have to understand and effectively mitigate risks and hazards in underground works. And uh, we have to plan underground rail networks in order to enable and safeguard future extension and project conditions and uh, project, uh, projects as such. Uh, on the right side of the picture, you can see one of these uh, high, so called high speed trains, and it's a, a railway section of Hanover Würzburg in, in Germany. We can go to the next slide, please. The next slide uh, shows uh, on the right side the Trans Asian Railway Network. Uh, you, can, you can see here uh, countries. Where I'm staying right now uh, uh, is, is in Thailand, and you can see in blue the uh, expansion of the railway from Thailand uh, down to Singapore, uh, starting uh, in, the, in the north of, of uh, China, of the city of so-called Kunming. And uh, <clears throat> we have uh, in the Trans-Asian Railway Network in particular, we have a number of different track gorges. Uh, which are indicated in different colors. For instance, in India, uh, we have track gauge width of uh, 1,676 millimeter, uh, whereas uh, in uh, China and Russia, uh, in, in parts of uh, China and Ru Russia, hello, the, the network quality is bad, which I understand, is that correct? And then uh, we have the European networks, uh, which are 1,435 millimeter. And then we have, uh, for instance, in, in Thailand, we have uh, 1,000 millimeter track gauge and so on. So you can see that uh, the Trans-Asian Railway Network is uh, kind of having uh, a, a problem from the point of view of track gauges only. So that, that must be standardized and, and unified. But from the project management tools, we are going, uh, we are going like, like walking from the document management system to the planning and design management system and the control of the workflow, including. Uh, then uh, we have to go through all more or less named office programs like Excel, Word, and and uh, finite element programs and so on. Then we have uh, to make the use also in part of the cost controlling program and the time controlling program, as it has been mentioned by General Surasama already, that cost and time, these are the, par the key parameters in the project development. We can go to the next slide. Next slide uh, is a slide which is evaluating project cost uh, over time. And uh, you can see that, uh, for instance, if we study the alternative of a project, uh, we have about 30% uh, of the basic cost and then addition to compensate project risk. And then we have an addition to compensate valorization. But uh, if we come into the into the uh, stage of permit application, then we have an increase in the basic cost, uh, and uh, we have a reduction in the uh, the uh, compensation of project risks, and also a little uh, reduction in addition to compensate valorization. And when it comes to procurement which is uh, absolutely very important and uh, a little bit uh, uh, like uh, treated like an orphan. But in the procurement stage, we have uh, the basic costs increase and uh, the cost for the uh, compensation valorization and uh, for the project risk are reduced. So that is the total uh, uh, project cost uh, distribution in three different stages. And then we have to also uh, take into consideration different uh, 
different, uh, let's call it departments uh, in the project cost and control development. And that is contract documentation, possibility for internal workflow, then the, the administration of additional orders, supplements and claims, which is one uh, very important uh, issue. Then the instrument for project controlling and budget planning, contact and address management, and also the possibility of administration of documents to the contract. The next slide, please. So from the point of view of documentation, uh, this is a special, special issue in, in every project. Uh, we have to understand the needs, what is from the contract, what are the needs. Then uh, we have to also look into the state, into the state, sorry, there is some state of the art or compliance to standard procedures. Then we have to prove of work done according to all preconditions. Uh, that is a very important subject which can make a project happen or fail. Then we have to look into the basis for quantity survey for claims, and we have to identify the changes uh, to the tender documents. There may be some changes, and that needs to be documented very carefully also. Then we have to also look into controlling of correction measures and the, con the documentation of the flow of the construction and, and the flow of the progress. So we can go to the next slide. And the next slide gives us some uh, more details on the construction process. Uh, demonstrated at the, with the example of the TBM excavation, a TBM excavation. For the TBM excavation, we have to look into the ground, into the TBM parameters, and into the geotechnical monitoring, whereas uh, in particular for the ground, we have to compare what is expected and what is encountered. And what is encountered uh, also has to be uh, looked into more detail from the point of view of the ground strengths, from the point of view of the permeability of the ground from the point of view of groundwater inflow, uh, from the point of view of fall zones, and from the point of view of caustic conditions. And uh, from the point of view of TBM parameter, we have to look into what are the targets for the operational and what are the values for that, and what is the face pressure values and which depends on the conditioning of the, of the face pressure content and what are the actual values. So these are TBM parameters, very important. And then of course, all of that uh, has to be also done while we are monitoring, geotechnically monitoring the ground. So from this uh, PROCON database, we go to the system analysis and behavior for different science, in, uh, different science. I mean, uh, for the for the owner of the project, for the uh, construction uh, contractor, for the consultant, and so on. And then we have to look into real time and what is uh, post processing. So all these together uh, is uh, the construction process demonstrated and at the, at the TBM excavation. For the Decision making uh, on re in regard to the technology, and in particular uh, the comparison, which usually is is done uh, in in many or almost uh, all the projects nowadays, that we compare the tunnel boring machine technology. Uh, used in the project with the NATM, which stands for New Austrian Tunneling Method. In ITA, we, call, we used to call it the conventional tunneling method. And we can see here uh, two different cross-sections, which are important to be compared. 
On the left side, we have TVM uh, driven tunnel, and on the right side, we have the cross section on the same conditions of a uh, conventional tunneling or NATM tunneling cross section. And uh, just by simply looking at the two cross sections, we can see that the uh, smaller cross section, the less excavation is uh, achieved with the conventional tunneling or NATM tunneling. And this is uh, uh, demonstrated uh, on a project uh, which is uh, in the uh, southwest of Vienna, uh, capital of Austria. It's a project called the Semmering Bay Tunnel. And uh, we can see here the portal on the upper right corner. It's called Portal Glocknitz. And on the lower left corner, we can see the portal of Mürztuschlag. And in between, we have a tunnel. And this tunnel is by for sure not the, the straight connection between the two portals. The tunnel makes uh, like an S-shaped curve or a double S-shaped curve. And we can see different uh, colors of the alignment. We can see the blue alignment and we can see the green alignment. And the green alignment is the alignment in the center part of the project. Uh, uh, which is uh, the so-called uh, lot SPT 2.1, central part of, of the project, where uh, we have a tunnel boring machine uh, driven tunnel. And uh, in the northern part and in the lower western part, we have blue colored uh, uh, alignments. And this is the conventional tunneling method or NATM tunneling method. And the, the, the rest uh, of it is uh, cut and cover construction at the beginning uh, in front uh, of the, just the connection with the, with the portals. So uh, <clears throat> this is a typical sample of the question, why had, did it take more than 20 years to make a decision for this alignment? And uh, these 20 years have been used in geotechnical uh, investigation, ex extensive geotechnical investigation, as uh, this is all uh, uh, crossing the mountain lines of the eastern part of the of the Alpine uh, ranges, and <clears throat> you can uh, understand that uh, the reason for the uh, different uh, decision of the alignment technologies has been geological reasons. Yeah, there, is, there is the source of uh, water uh, in the mountain. The, the mountain actually is a huge reservoir of water. And uh, the water has been uh, uh, kind of a, a criteria for the decision for the, for the alignment. Because it was uh, considered uh, that uh, this water May, may cause uh, such huge problems that uh, the designer and the owner of the project decided uh, or took a long time for the decision to make uh, uh, this uh, alignment, which definitely is uh, increasing the length of the distance between the two portals by about 30 or 40 percent which also is uh, uh, costing. Of course, there is more cost. There is more time needed for the construction also. But altogether has been evaluated in particular for this project. And so this was how the decision uh, has been made. Uh, and it is, it is in construction. It's almost finished right now. It's very, very close to finishing. And it is a very good uh, example of how uh, geotechnical investigations should, should be uh, carefully executed in order to, to form the base for the best decision. We can go to the next slide. The next slide also shows an, another section uh, of uh, high-speed railway, so-called high-speed railway in Austria. High-speed railway 
it's not 200 kilometers per hour in Austria, it's 160 kilometers per hour in Austria. And uh, you can see in red uh, the sections uh, where we have uh, made uh, tunnel, con tunnel uh, decisions based on careful ground investigations. Uh, on the right side, you can see Vienna, capital of Austria, in the very uh, eastern part of Austria. And then uh, between Vienna, there is a, a, a red line, which is a new uh, tunnel project, uh, uh, tunnel line in, in uh, the eastern part of Austria. Uh, in the southern part of Austria, we have two. We have both the Semmering Base Tunnel, which we just discussed uh, about uh, how it is going to perform. And also we have in the southern part of Austria, the connection between uh, Graz, uh, which is my alma mater, and Klagenfurt. And uh, there is a, a mountain chain in between also with a so-called uh, Koralm tunnel, which is uh, already completed, a tunnel construction connecting uh, uh, this uh, center and southern part of Austria. And then we have on the left side, uh, we have uh, uh, the western part of Austria, and uh, in Innsbruck, capital of, of, of uh, Tyrol, uh, and in, in that uh, part we have the so-called Brenner Base Tunnel, uh, which connects uh, uh, Munich uh, with uh, Verona in the southern part of Italy through a, a, a 56 kilometer long double, uh, not double lane, but uh, single track, uh, double tunnel uh, uh, in between uh, and uh, some uh, intersection stations in between also. So there are basically four major tunnel projects uh, in construction or almost completed in Austria right now, which show that uh, this is uh, a real uh, renaissance of, of uh, railway in the center part of Europe. Next slide, please. The next slide uh, is uh, defining the process uh, of the controlling in three steps. And the first step is the definition of the project risks and measures and uh, mitigation measures in particular. So uh, underground works is something which uh, in the past has had the taste of being dangerous, of being uh, uh, late uh, in, in regards to construction and being expensive also. But today we have uh, tools in our contracts which gives us uh, the, uh, uh, the, the safeguard uh, in order to to start projects and to end projects on time and on budget with the help of uh, risk management and uh, with the help of uh, geotechnical baselines, which are agreed uh, at the beginning of the project. Now, step number two is the analysis of the behavior of the system. So the behavior of the system is, is uh, decisive. And uh, why it is decisive? Because this is the area where we have to, to rely on the experience of the uh, designer, of the uh, experience of the contractor also. So uh, the behavior means that uh, we excavate and we have a certain behavior after excavation in general, which is uh, deformation. Uh, and uh, in order to handle the, the risk of deformation, deformations are unavoidable. It's just the size of the deformation which is, which is important, that, which has to be managed. So how can we, how can we manage the uh, behavior of the ground? We can behavior, uh, manage the behavior of the ground with uh, the uh, contractual tools. The contractual tools are the two tools which are, I used to call the twin brothers, which is the risk management plan 
and the geothermal behavior, uh, the geothermal uh, uh, baseline uh, report. And then uh, in step number three, uh, as part of uh, a third part of the process control, uh, we have to make a, and understand the real time analysis by an, a large cybernetic system. So uh, this is really uh, the, the most advanced uh, technology uh, which we can have, but uh, uh, which we have to use in, a, in the so-called uh, kybernetic system of the construction. We can go to the next slide, please. The, the next Time analysis. But slide number nineteen. But it should it should be a slide number uh, fifteen. Yes. No, sixteen. Slide number fifteen. Sixteen is uh, talking about the real-time analysis. So <clears throat> from the real-time analysis, we have to feed the database, the PROCON database, and we have to analyze what should be done and what is done. How? In, by using uh, scientific method uh, of uh, neuronal networks, fuzzy logic and neurophysic technology, but also by finite element simulation and uh, by uh, uh, operation technical uh, plans, then uh, we also have to feed in the model of the, of the ground, of the geology. Then we have to feed in the documentation of the ground and the geotechnical measurement program as well. So all, all this together, uh, will uh, uh, be provided to the geotechnical expert department and will also result in uh, working instruction for the con for the uh, construction for the excavation and support. So we can go to the next demand and control. Slide number 17, order demand and performance control. What is the client's order? The client's order in regards to diaphragm wall, in regards to overlap foundations and uh, jet piles if we are in, in a urban environment, which is always happening. Then uh, the designer defines the demands for a tight pit from the point of view of the strength, of the leakage of water, and so on. So that, that can be a shaft construction also. Shafts, uh, usually in hydropower stations, we have a lot of shaft construction. But sometimes we also have shaft constructions in inner urban uh, construction projects. And the contractor has to perform demands on uh, regard uh, in regard to uh, his uh, working records in regard to the quality and strengths of his product and uh, also in regards to if eventually uh, leaking of water into that. Uh, so it uh, re uh, refers to quality, plausibility in slide number 18. Slide number, number 18 is document control. Document control uh, is all about archiving. We have to, the contractor has to uh, provide uh, archiving files. Uh, it creates the necessary documents up to the standards of the contract. The supervisor has to uh, provide archiving documents which are controlled and passed on to the client. And the client is archiving all these together uh, at the site and with easy access of uh, 
everybody uh, who uh, has uh, the authority to to go to this to to the archives and to to make himself so we can go to nineteen and slide number nineteen refers to plausibility and quality. Slide number nineteen. Yes. Slide number 19, uh, uh, with regard to plausibility, uh, it makes initial documents and uh, document check. They have to be plausible. Uh, what is the plausibility in that regard? Mostly <clears throat> in regard to already existing uh, documents from previous projects or from neighboring projects. The purpose, uh, if the documents are passed on without checks, any effort otherwise can be meaningless. So we have to have these uh, purpose de definition very, very clearly. The amount of papers produced is no guarantee for the quality. So the quality has to be specified uh, in the contract documents at the beginning of the project. And the uh, software uh, application for the recording makes only sense if the recordings are checked for their correctness. So the check uh, is done by the contractor and the supervising engineer, which has to take time and know how to make all the, the checks, uh, all the necessary checks and all the plausibility of the necessary checks. So we can go to the next slide, please. And the next slide uh, is uh, just uh, giving uh, explanations on the design process. So we basically we have a project preparation and this after project preparation follows the general design. In the project preparation, uh, we argue and document and motivation for the project. And we define and document objectives of the project. And we establish a reliable base for the following steps. So <clears throat> if you look to the right side, you can see how this develops from the project preparation to the general design. For the project preparation, which starts with the project idea, and then followed by the definition of scope and objectives for the project. And in the general design phase, we have a feasibility study and conceptual design. Then we go from that, uh, uh, from that conceptual design, uh, possibly uh, into studying alternatives of the project, and finally come up uh, with a preliminary design as the next step of the conceptual design. And after the preliminary design, we go into the preparation for the permit application. So this process is all specifically tailored. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. Yes, the slide. Configuration. Next slide, please. Deciding on the configuration is, uh, just has been deliberated. The feasibility study followed by the conceptual design, where the goals are highly depending on the type of the project. We have to address uh, international topics in a uh, railway. Uh, project design, we have to address and discuss possible alternatives. Then we have to evaluate capacity requirements and define uh, system layout, track configuration, configuration of junctions, configuration and uh, design of stations and so on to finally address the key operational we will show some uh, 
project examples in the following slides. We can go to the following slide, number 22, where we uh, decide on the alignment and uh, on the alternatives. And that's a, that's a brilliant example. We have seen uh, in the slides before the uh, connection of the Semmering Base Tunnel and what the decision has been made after more than 20 years of uh, ground investigations. And here we can see in different colors in uh, uh, yellow and red and blue and green, uh, the <clears throat> connection between the portal in Glocknitz and the portal in Mürz Zuschlag in, uh, uh, Aust uh, in Austria, in the southwestern part of uh, Vienna. So uh, studying the alternative means that uh, we have to develop alternatives and then we have to evaluate those alternatives against project goals and compare the alternatives in a multidisciplinary approach and uh, then come up with the best solution and with the decision for the for the best solution so you can you can see here very dramatically that why it took more than 20 years to come up with the decision because all of these uh, possible alignments which are focused on avoiding the very, very uh, valuable underground uh, storage of, uh, of, of crystal clear and, and clean, actually mineral water, uh, which is uh, used for the supply, for the uh, water supply of the city of Vienna which is compared with uh, most uh, cities in, in India and in Asia, a small city of only 2 million, in, 2 million inhabitants. But anyway, these uh, in 2 million inhabitants, they are very proud of having clean and, and uh, clear water uh, at their availability, daily availability. So uh, this is the decision to be made uh, on the alignment and then the decision to be made on the uh, construction technology. Next slide, slide number 23. Slide number 23 is uh, uh, the decision on more on project details. You can see here what the preliminary design is defining. Finding technical features of the rail project into much more detail. Then it is also developing a secondary structure uh, as needed and protective measures, and also uh, the execution of the project uh, enters into the stage of optimization to maximize the benefits and to minimize negative effects. So that, that is already a quite uh, deciding detail on this uh, section, which is uh, close to the uh, western part of Vienna. Next slide, please, slide number 24, is explaining into more detail the project idea in the early design phase. So the feedback to the previous phase is required if the solution is unacceptable. So there are maybe also legal requirements. And if it is not uh, applicable, then uh, there is a failure in success. Then uh, we have to apply in this early design phase also a broad holistic approach, a comprehensive approach. And then focus in particular on critical, on relevant critical aspects. And then coordinate the specifications for the collection of data, for the uh, also uh, def definition of uh, requirements in order to make decisions. So again, we have project idea, we have definition 
of uh, scope and objectivities in the preparation phase. And in the general design phase, we have feasibility, we have uh, alternative uh, studies, we have uh, finally come to the preliminary design and from the preliminary design to the preparation for the uh, application of uh, permit. So the next slide, please. The next slide will be slide number 25. Slide number 25 talks about traffic, uh, technology, environment, and cost. OK, so uh, from the point of view of uh, traffic and hello, traffic and technology, we have to look into enabled uh, focus, uh, deciding, making, including aspects uh, uh, of te technology, which needs to be separately addressed, and aspects of the environmental impact, uh, which uh, needs to be analyzed uh, in a broad multidisciplinary approach and uh, a structured approach according to environmental disciplines. And then we have to talk about cost issues. Uh, and there is a challenge due to lack of information and uh, numerous risky uncertainties. So this is uh, basically a challenge uh, in regard to geotechnology. Uh, and it uh, relates to uh, people and uh, area and environment. And then we have uh, a uh, aspect also from the point of view of, of cost and risk. And uh, finally, uh, to use uh, respective uh, decision making tools. Next slide, please. Next slide is slide number 26. Slide number 26 uh, explains in more detail uh, what we have to consider when we look into cost control in the design. The, the, the biggest uh, uh, risk at the, at the beginning is the route selection. And then after the route selection, uh, we have the controllability, controllability of cost uh, is getting uh, smaller and smaller. We have a declining uh, curve and we have an increasing curve with regard to the information on, on the project. So at the beginning, uh, the information is very, very low, very little. And then we have an increasing uh, information uh, status when we go from route selection to pre-design and then to the permission stage and to the detailed design and finally to the construction. So from that point of view, what are esti the estimates? The estimates are uh, challenged by the cost in the early design phase. The project knowledge is not completed uh, in the early design phase. Of course, it's getting better and better uh, as much as we continue to develop the project. The high level of uncertainties in the basic data for the construction cost estimate is a, a high level of uh, uncertainty at, at the beginning. And this high level of uncertainty is decreasing also. The specific cost estimate approach is required uh, and uh, the control controllability of the cost is getting better and better. And the application of uh, ads on basic costs at several levels of cost estimate process uh, is also uh, development of uh, uh, depending on the development of, of the project and the development on information. Uh, next, next slide, please. The next slide is slide number 27. <clears throat> Slide number 27 talks about the understanding of transportation. So transportation uh, is a public investment. Uh, it is an investment in research and human capital development. 
and it has yielded many benefits and has never been as important as it is today, but whether and how it can be sustained remains an open question. With regard to innovation, there is a remarkable degree of innovation and transportation projects and efforts to meet the great challenges of disruptive technological changes and climate change are resulting in a myriad natural experiments across the country. So uh, this uh, climate change, uh, of course, is an issue or an, an subject uh, which is which never has been as uh, urgent as it is today, and it would justify a special lecture just on climate change and uh, influences uh, from underground construction, in particular, in uh, uh, urban environments. Then uh, we have to understand uh, transportation from the point of view of consequences. We are many of the consequences of continued innovation and automation of transportation depend heavily on how people will respond and adapt to these changes, which is now always predictable. It became predictable. And then we have to also look into side effects as it is important as human behavior is to understand transportation and uh, its side effects. However, only a very small share of transportation data gathering and research and development funding addresses human behavior in transportation in, systematic, in a systematic fashion. So uh, <clears throat> it means that uh, we are talking about uh, changing, changing conditions. In, in, in transportation, changing conditions with regard to the technology. And I mean primarily not the technology uh, of, the, uh, of the vehicles, but uh, of the technology of uh, underground construction. As underground construction is uh, gaining more and more importance uh, in uh, underground infrastructure or in infrastructure in urban areas. Uh, <clears throat> OK. So we can go to the next slide, please. The next slide uh, shows uh, you the expansion of the intercontinental highways. And uh, here you can see that uh, on the right side, unfortunately, the quality of the slide is not very good but it's the best I could gain, where we connect uh, Japan on the right side of the slide uh, through China, going through China, and then uh, going through uh, uh, Vietnam, and, and uh, then finally also moving uh, through Thailand, and, and uh, from there <coughs> going further to Myanmar, and finally uh, crossing uh, India also, and going from India uh, through the Middle East states, different countries, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and so on, uh, crossing also through Iran, political hotspot right now, Turkey, and then after crossing the, the Bosporus, entering into, into Europe. So this is a uh, development uh, expansion practically insight into the development of uh, expanding underground in this 28 and this this is intercontinental highway network the asian highway network slide number 28 is showing and explaining network of roads. And can we go to the slide number 29, please? Yeah. The network of roads, the Asian Highway Network or the Great Asian Highway is a network of 141 kilometers of roads 
running across 32 countries. It is a link to Europe, and it is being built with the intention to improve transport facilities throughout these nations and provide road links between Asia and Europe. The Asian uh, Highway Network is a part of the Asian Land Transport Infrastructure Development, or also in short, ALTIT, a project being supported by the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, in short, the ESCAP. The ESCAP is a very powerful uh, organization within the United Nations. There are three projects. The LTIT program comprises of these three projects. The other two being the Trans-Asian Railway and the facilitation of land transport project. And the intention of the LTIT program is to provide a cost-effective transport links with an international trade uh, through this link. So uh, this uh, gives us an understanding how our, our world is coming closer together thanks to the use of uh, infrastructure, in particular, the use of underground infrastructure. Next slide, please. Now I would like to give you a more concrete example of a project development which is in progress. And this example is the so-called uh, Phuket uh, Highway Tunnel in the south of Thailand. It's on an island. It's, it's on a beautiful island and uh, very famous for uh, vacations on, on that island. <coughs> we can go to the next slide and come into more details. Why uh, do we use, why do we take why do we take underground uh, construction uh, when we cross a mountain? We can cross a mountain on the roads also, but what happens when we cross uh, when we are uh, in a traffic uh, heavy traffic situation on a uh, mountain crossing uh, road? We can see on the right side of this picture here. Uh, as one example, such accidents happens daily, almost daily, and made it uh, made it so important for uh, these uh, for this uh, island to uh, make use of underground construction and to drive a tunnel. Now we can go to the next slide. The next slide shows you this cross mountain tunnel of uh, road 4029 and uh, in red in red I don't know if you can see my my arrow here in in red you can see uh, the the road uh, uh, on the right side the portal village area is called Khartoum and uh, on the uh, western side on the uh, left side of the slide, the end of the red line. This uh, area is called Patong or Patong Beach. And you can see several several of these roads uh, ending into that Katong Beach, which is a beautiful bay area and uh, slowly recovering from the COVID, from the negative COVID effects. We can go to the to the next slide. So keep in mind it is uh, road number 4029, which we are looking for into more detail now. Next slide. The next slide shows again, you know, different uh, alignment studies. Unfortunately, by far not uh, uh, as much uh, geotechnical investigation uh, of what we have seen from the from the Semmering Bay tunnel in one of the previous slides. But uh, anyway, a number of alternatives have been studied and you can see here the alternative in red, in blue, in green, in, in orange and in uh, pink also with different uh, points. All of them uh, driving uh, tunnels uh, under, under these uh, mountain uh, areas. The overburden is, is not very, very much, 
the maximum overburden is about 180 meters, but uh, it's for sure uh, a bigger, bigger tunnel. And we can look into the cross section of this tunnel and into the specifics of this uh, tunnel as it has been decided uh, from the point of view of design and contract preparation, but is not in construction yet. So let me, let me take the next slide, number 34. It shows the geotechnical baseline report and uh, the assessment of that uh, uh, geology here. We can see two, two different types of uh, rocks. Uh, basically, we, we have the granite, the weathered granite uh, rock in, in, in pink in the cross section. And we have the, the blue uh, rock, which is uh, uh, a more slightly uh, uh, weathered granite, uh, but more highly uh, weathered granite than the uh, pink uh, area here. And all of these uh, parameters which have been studied, like the uh, uniaxial compressive strengths, the behavior uh, of the of the rock in the very cross section, the rock quality designation percentage, the water inflow, the rock class, and so on. So all of these uh, needs needs to be studied uh, and uh, has to be entered into the uh, geotechnical baseline report. And we can go to the next slide. The next slide uh, shows uh, the challenge, the geologic challenge from the point of weathered granite and residual sandy soils. Uh, on the left side, uh, you can see the weathered granite. <coughs> it's, it's a granite uh, which uh, needs uh, drill and blast, but for sure the decision whether it is drill and blast or whether it is uh, mechanized tunneling excavation method used uh, has not been made so far, but you can see that uh, the residual sandy soil on the, rest, uh, on the right side, which is in the entrance area of the portal of the uh, eastern portal. Next slide, please. The next slide shows uh, the decision for the, for the alignment. Uh, we have the eastern portal and the western portal, and uh, we have the intersections, and uh, uh, we also have the toll stations on both sides. And we, we can see also uh, the uh, main line, and uh, <coughs> we can see also the area where we have, uh, uh, where we are influencing with the tunnel, uh, the uh, re residential areas and <clears throat> on, on, on both sides. So uh, this, is, this is the area of the future Phuket Road Tunnel, and we will go into the cross section now with the next slide and discuss about the cross section. Uh, you can see uh, the two cross sections uh, from the point of view of the uh, west western portal, uh, which is uh, the portal near to Patong, we can see the size of the cross section, which is 12.6 meter high and 17.1 meter wide, and uh, we can see also on the on the right side that uh, we have. Uh, a so-called motorcycle line. So there, there are twin tunnels. These are twin tunnels uh, as, the, as the concept for this tunnel, uh, with four lanes in each direction, using a barrier uh, between the lanes in order to separate the uh, personal uh, uh, car, uh, the uh, PC uh, car and the MC lanes which is the motorcycle lanes. The passenger cars uh, have uh, two lanes in each direction. Each lane has a, a lane uh, width of 3.5 uh, meters. 
and two meters on the left shoulder and uh, 0.5 meters on the right shoulder. In the motorcycle lanes, uh, also in uh, two directions, their lane width is 1.75 meter with the one point meter on the left uh, shoulder and uh, point, uh, uh, 0.5 meter on the right shoulder. And then we have let me switch on the light just a moment. System, yes. Please uh, note that the ventilation system, which is a uh, ventilator, a ventilator uh, with jet fans. So these uh, jet fans provide, as the tunnel is not not very long, you know, that uh, 1500 meters long, about 1500 meters long. So uh, the ventilation can be managed with jet fans, which are hanging on uh, the area. Uh, also, you can see are implemented in that area. What is also important to note is that uh, we have a full, uh, full closed ring condition here because of the size of the tunnel. So the size of the tunnel is, is uh, quite unusual uh, if we compare it uh, with uh, uh, European tunnels we will see that uh, it is it is significantly less this size is about uh, 200 square meter of excavation which is very very remarkable size almost the size of an underground uh, metro station Okay, so we have uh, a closed drain condition. Uh, we have drainage system uh, in the in the lower part of the of the invert, and we have uh, also drainage system uh, to uh, when we clean the the, the carriage way. Then uh, we have surface water also. So water in, in, in is an important issue. Uh, in underground construction. <clears throat> there will be also uh, cross passages. It's just a dotted line here, which we can see from the point of view of cross passages. And we can go to the, to the next slide. And the next slide shows the access uh, on the uh, west side, on the Patong Beach side which is a significant, uh, has a significant impact on this uh, holiday village uh, or holiday resort area of uh, Phuket uh, Island. And we can go to the next slide, please. And the next slide shows the east side. Uh, before entering uh, the, the mountain, we can see also in the center part of the of the picture uh, the toll station. Uh, traffic management is of utmost importance, and it can only be done uh, if we have uh, if we can provide to the to the uh, traffic participants uh, sufficient uh, comfort uh, from the point of view of the of the toll station. So these toll stations. Is just uh, in front of the, of the portal of the uh, Katun village site on the eastern side of the of the. Park. So we can go to the to the next one. The uh, land borehole investigation program. Uh, we have soil investigation investigation areas, rock investigation areas. Very rarely here. Mostly decided to do it on the on the portal side, both uh, on the east portal and on the west portal side, 
and we had a little bit more material investigation on the West Portal side, on which side uh, all of these uh, soil investigations have not been done so far, but are in preparation for the construction and, and for the uh, issue of, of the con contract documents later on. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Let's see the excavation and support stages in conventional tunneling as it is going to be applied uh, for the uh, Phuket Road Tunnel Project. We have uh, uh, stages of excavation. We have the stage of, of mucking, muck removal. Then uh, we have the stage of uh, in installation of lattice gearers and, and other types of support. Then we have uh, the installation of rock bolting, uh, both in the longitudinal section and in the cross section also. And then <coughs> we go further down. Uh, anyway, um, it is followed by the excavation of the invert and then completion of the uh, of the so-called uh, primary lining, which is the short grid lining and the uh, short grid uh, application, and then uh, the installation of the final lining, which is a cast in place concrete uh, excavation. We can look into the next slide. And the dance to, uh, construction sequence of transportation tunnels after finishing initial lining installation with excavation and support, as we have just now seen it. Uh, installation of the waterproofing membrane in order to get uh, dry conditions in the tunnel. Then on top of the waterproofing membrane, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the arch reinforcement, uh, which is coming uh, before the waterproofing membrane. And then uh, we have the cast in place concrete lining on the lower part of the cross section and the cast in place uh, uh, final lining after installation and after a uh, form working uh, and uh, coming to the to the final uh, structure to the permanent structure I would also like to show you just briefly as it has been one uh, issue of uh, tunneling association of India, one of the previous uh, uh, lectures on uh, cross section. We can go to the next slide and have a look to the cross section. Uh, passage cross section. In the passage cross section, we have the connection between uh, east and, and west or north and south uh, tunnel alignment. Uh, also, this offers the possibility for uh, having. Uh, instrumentation and for having electrical equipment uh, and uh, control uh, of uh, uh, different, but in particular also in, in the case that there is a fire that we have uh, in one tunnel uh, a fire and then we can uh, send the people through this cross passage to the other tunnel and to get them safely out of the of the problematic uh, zone in the tunnel. So we can go to the, to the, is the summary slide. And the summary slide <coughs> basically talks about uh, transport tunnels, which are likely uh, other infrastructure projects, uh, but have been plagued by huge cost and time that deviate significantly from their original value. So the, the problems might be caused by administrative issues, but also by geological or geotechnical issues and investigation. The problems might be caused also by poor engineering and by inefficient design. So 
Railway infrastructure are requiring high safety standard, and uh, this is essential for both national and international border crossing railway networks. Highway tunnels, uh, when compared with road transport, have a demand on high degree of safety, which will strengthen the market position of railway transport uh, project in general. Uh, to support the planning of operators from the safety point of view, comprehensive risk assessment uh, shall be used uh, in operation. Risk assessment also in tunnel engineering shall be derived to ensure high safety levels <clears throat> when implementing changes in existing infrastructures. Risk allocation. Uh, related uh, are simple and effective methods uh, in construction contracts to better control risks. It must be included in uh, the Tutankhamen baseline report and risk management plan as being part of the contract document. Tutankhamen baseline report is a contract tool for owners and contractors to provide the ability to define the level of geotechnical risk and of respective uh, financial consequences. And has, has been mentioned uh, by General Suresh Sama in the introduction notes, where he said that uh, FIDIC has issued a so-called Emerald uh, Report, uh, FIDIC Emerald uh, uh, issue which has been launched at the WTC 2019 in, in Naples and which includes uh, these very important contract tools as part of these city conditions. The guidelines, uh, there are ITA guidelines for the preparation of geotechnical baseline reports. There are guidelines uh, from the American Society of Civil Engineers which are experience. And if we come to the next and final slide, just as a conclusion uh, to today's online uh, lecture on transport tunnels, uh, talks about, can we go to the next slide, please? The conclusion talks about uh, the demand for proper developed transport tunnels. It has been continuously growing. The, the intensification of rail and road networks has been shown uh, in the slides and shall provide better communication between regions, countries, and even continents or islands with alignments corresponding to the demand of shortening travel times in response to sustainable and resilient requirements. The conventional tunneling method as well as the mechanized tunneling method are well-suited technologies for underground transport tunnels in increasing difficult, complex, and changing geologically geotechnical and contractual conditions. <clears throat> and the main purpose uh, remains to minimize construction time and cost by selecting best suitable and advanced contract conditions based on FIDIC Emerald Book, FIDIC uh, Emerald Book conditions. Optimum driving cross section, driving methods, and lining during the design and construction phases. So all these are excellent uh, tools to be used in the future of increasing underground infrastructure markets with increasing urban uh, development, with increasing number of megacities, which all depends on underground infrastructure providing to uh, young students and young uh, engineers uh, unbelievable uh, 
conditions to make uh, careers in the in the professional in the professional life and to to help and to support our civilization our development of uh, uh, the the economy of better controlling uh, climate change of uh, better uh, bettering the the life of uh, urban populations so all this uh, is uh, very very uh, stimulating uh, the uh, future of uh, of underground structures and the confidence uh, into underground structures in 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 the in the broader sense and with that i mean that the future uh, man of the year hopefully in one of the future years could be one from india and could be also one who is getting the uh, required exposure at wtc's at world tunnel congresses when india will have uh, will be the candidate the successful candidate of future world tunnel congresses so with that uh, thank you very much for your attention and i would like to also uh, give you the opportunity to ask uh, questions and i will answer to your questions with big pleasure and with with my honor I, I can see General Sharma right now. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I don't see any any hands popping up. So the, uh, the impression that I gather is that uh, a lecture or a talk delivered by uh, Dr. Wagner is so clear that it leaves no doubts. Uh, well, if there are none, let me let me conclude the talk with the permission of the speaker, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you will agree with me that uh, in just about hour and a half, precisely, Dr. Wagner has taken us through the entire gamut of planning to execution to post construction. That is the maintenance and operation part of the tunneling. He's very versatile, you know that, okay, you ask him a question, he, he will always have a very, very relevant answer. But uh, to summarize and to sum up as to, you know, what lessons do we take home, there are plenty. Uh, today's talk, today's talk was primarily focused on many subjects, but he started with a worldwide scan of the underground systems and the transportation systems as to how within the European Union, within Asia, how people are looking at the transportation models of the future. Ex extending the existing lines, adding some new, strengthening some new, uh, making multiple line, you know, if it is double lane, making it four lane, if it is two lane railway system, making it four line railway system and things like that. Next, he graduated onto the various management tools which are available today to the industry to do various things. And important aspects which came out was ultimately, what is the ultimate aim? Aim is to deliver a safe project with no time and cost overrun. Please remember, while to the community it's an asset, but to the builder it is a business. Okay, you must also never forget that. And it, it doesn't make business sense for anybody if they, we are going to incur more costs than what has been planned. And there are multiple reasons we need to arrest that trend. They should be minimized, that there should be no cost and time overruns. He also covered the aspect of uh, documentation, which is so very important. And like I always say that documentation is for the posterity, not only what is going on. So the documents have to be properly recorded, saved, and also cataloged. And both by the builder, by the client, and also by the supervisor, so that these can be useful when required at the right time. Okay. Even for, for later on, should we run into any kind of a litigation? Should we run into any kind of arbitration? What comes in handy 
to both the parties is the documentation. Uh, Professor Wagner covered in details the planning and design part. That designing is not that it, it is designed in one go. We all understand that, okay, firstly, the concept design, then the preliminary design, then the detailed design, it's an iterative process. Okay, then the ancillary design, there are so many things, uh, but he did highlight the project cost and control. Uh, uh, amongst the technical issues, he's brought up the GBR, uh, that is the geotechnical baseline report, which is very, very important. Uh, alignments, you know, multiple options are given to the client and he chooses one alignment. It is only once the alignment is fixed, then the design is developed. Process control, real-time analysis. As we progress during the construction, there's a real-time analysis being done and minor, like I, I did say in my opening remarks, that minor changes in design, minor changes in the construction methodologies are permitted and it's being done depending upon how the real-time situation changes. And that's why we brought the importance of flexibility in the contract. And it's being permitted, it's being permitted world over. Uh, he did cover the various concepts of twin tunnel concept, excavation and logistic supports. Uh, but what was interesting is also that transportation, ladies and gentlemen, we all understand is a public investment. Okay, because it's for the used by the masses. So the social impact has to be studied. Cost benefit analysis. And these days what is becoming more important is along with the technical parameters is also the climate. There is so much of noise now being made, not only noise, even a meaningful intervention being made about the climate change, okay? And the other part of it is, since we're dealing with the transportation, the, the climate, not only the climate change, also we are now talking about the resilience, that whatever infrastructure is being created should be climatically resilient. More about it in some other subject. Uh, he brought out an important aspect this is the intercontinental highways now, and it's no longer the interstate highways. Okay, now we are talking of the intercontinental, no longer the inter intercountry. It's from one continent. He brought it out from Japan to China to other parts of Southeast Asia, entering India, graduate actually going through Iran and leaning on to Europe through Bosphorus. And that's how it is 1,41,000 kilometers passing through 32 countries. What an amazing thing. And it's it's under execution. If you ever travel to northeastern part of India, and if you go towards Manipur, you will travel that way. It's written AH, Asian Highway. It's being it's, it's, it's one of the national highways, but nominated as an Asian Highway. It's part of that AH. Uh, in the end, he did mention that, see, ladies and gentlemen, you must understand that even in India today, we have no one single agency, which is uh, which is mandated to write the codes for tunnels. There are very few codes. Uh, Dr. Wagner will be aware with me. There are very few codes. What is available today through the ITA is the guidelines. And world over, these guidelines are being followed. They are almost like codes, but codal specifications are mostly yet to be written. That's one aspect. I think the tunneling community world over needs to be serious about it and more so in India, because I think we are doing so much of tunneling, but it's all not coded as yet. That is one. And second, he did mention in passing, not in specific, but I would like to highlight that whether it is a design stage or it is at the execution stage, optimization is the key word. Most of us who are dealing with the subject are engineers. Even when you land up with a contractor, he would like to review the design so that the designs are opti optimized. Uh, I'm not saying that, okay, cutting the cost by cutting corners, no, but optimizing the design so that the cost can be optimized, the time can be optimized. With that, I won't elaborate any more. I think it's a wonderful lecture series, always delivered by pleasure always, you will agree with me, hearing Dr. Wagner. And once again, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for being on board with us. God bless thank you. you. And bye-bye, uh, ladies and gentlemen, till, you, till we see each other once again. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, General Zamba, for your very, very uh, well-addressed and, and uh, fantastic interpreted and, and whatever my, my poor English cannot no, 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 no. do you.
Then uh, you have you have done a fantastic uh, explanation. Thank you, thank you very much for for your inside feeling. You know, this is <laughs> this is so rare. This is so so rare, and. Uh, I hope we can do a lot uh, in the future together. Uh, the, the, the situation is not permitting. Otherwise, I would have registered myself as your student, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, somewhere that okay, even at this late stage in life, I would have been, I'm still, I, I would still like to admit it here in an open forum. I'm your student, you know. I learn every time I listen to you, I learn so much and make my own notes. Okay, what I heard from you last time, and it's very useful to me. And I'm sure it's not only me, all those who are on the on the, on the watch today, I will agree with me that it's always a pleasure. And uh, maybe we are waiting, very eagerly waiting that, okay, should the situation permit to get you over to India so that you can physically meet us, deliver some of the talks, interact with some of our things. Let's hope so. We keep praying that one fine day, yes, we will be able to. Okay, that's it. So Thank we you, will conclude it. Uh, Kalpana, anything else? Nothing, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Left in Genesis Sharma, thank you to the participants. Stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.